So I'm finally putting this sun-powered battery pack fully charged with the internal battery as well. So basically an off-grid uh, camera that will just keep going. Got a LTE signal. There's a, a chip in there, um, but I don't have to pay for that pen. And I've set it on the time-lapse mode. The minimum, uh, the maximum amount of, uh, uh, yeah, the minimum amount of time between takes is uh, three minutes. So I'm going to start with that and monitor battery consumption. And then, uh, you know, adjust it, adjust it for my phone, which is the beauty. And uh, you can pay for a plan where it stores the pictures, um, but the LTE just sends it to you. So I don't really need to store any because uh, I've got good cell signal out here. So... I think this is going to be the ridge of the first one, and I was just, in figuring out where to site this camera, I was thinking, okay, well, first of all, where am I putting my first sheets? And uh, and I've considered a lot of options that run uh, parallel to the, excuse me, perpendicular to the slope of the, you know, these ridges. So instead of, you know, having uh, tarps run the way the water wants to run, you know, you could run them the other way, and I think you'd probably be able to make the water slow down more. Um, and you do want the water to slow down overall. Uh, that's a goal. So hopefully that's achieved by the plastic and the rocks, and that seems like a pretty good start, honestly, just to get the water to slow down enough to, to get underneath the initial layer. Um, but actually, the most efficient way I can't, I gotta imagine, is a catchment. Right, so let's say there's polyfilm four feet wide running in strips up the ridge. I don't know, that ridge is, geez, is it 500 feet? I'm not sure. Maybe the strip I have will go up one way at one time, <laughs> probably. Um, but if you were to run it straight up, uh, maybe on the waterway, I don't know, or I did not necessarily have a waterway. Uh, um, but in such a way that the water that lands on the surface of the tarp, you know, some of it, hopefully a decent portion or a small portion, goes to the plant sites that are planted along that, um, that line. Uh, but we also want to recharge the reservoir because when it's raining, that's, um, you know, when it's raining, yeah, we want it to absorb as much as it can. But in fact, most of the surface area under the sky, um, you know, where it's competing for rainfall or, uh, or you know, runoff is, uh, you know, it's a much greater area than the, the stem of the tree, particularly in the Joshua Tree's case and definitely in the Creosote Bush's case and, and apparently many desert plants. And they're competing for that water as it reaches the surface because it's so scarce. So it's reduced to that surface level uh, competition. And when I saw the California juniper, uh, Joshua Tree woodland with Ocotillo, no, not, not Ocotillo, with um, Choya, um, oftentimes the California juniper would be the shelter plant, um, but two large trees, you know, one Joshua tree and one uh, California juniper, um, you know, large bush basically, uh, in the same space. And, you know, there, there was definitely more water for sure. Um, here's hotter as well, uh, on top of more dry, but, um, so, you know, the ways in which they compete for soil moisture and at what layer, uh, I don't think it's as straightforward as necessarily their, their area under the sky or next to runoff areas. Um, and, uh, you know, if we think up close about what a, what a root is able to do when rain is falling, let's say it reaches three centimeters down, um, you know, with a couple hour rain. Uh, and then, you know, so you've got Leave, you got roots that when it comes to actual water absorption it's through hair like um you know capillary uh um, roots that grow out of main roots um and sometimes those are very fibrillous uh, filamentous and other times they're not um and uh so that goes to say as much as uh we think of the spacing between the plants here as being determined by the competitiveness for water in the history that goes into why it is the way to say but the limiting factor being the water uh, and, and the dryness and the, the time it comes in the air um they're competing for for that for that sparse water um but over time, so the, the aquifers here were full because it was wetter before, so that's for sure. And, and they are down so deep now, entirely and solely because human activity. Um, and uh, I would love to think of this region's capacity if uh, the aquifers were as full as they were in 1800, and uh, the forests of the Native Americans were here, you know, as they were before 1500. Uh, because right after 1500, you have, uh, you know, essentially in, in ecological times, you have the introduction of destructive, uh, introduction of destructive uh, pests like rats and pigs and horses to some degree, you could consider, uh, and, and other things along with disease uh, on the uh, European. So, but that's ultimately what we're trying to get the system back to, right? Fill the aquifers, get an established forest, and, uh, you know, then when you're talking about what can this place produce, it's really about the sun and about the water. And, and that's where we really unlock the productive capacity of deserts. Uh, so.